Hello, welcome back to Retro Break. So last year I did retrospectives on three different game series. We've got Super Monkey Ball, we've got Trackmania, and we've got Umihara Kawase. And while I was playing Umihara Kawase, something struck me about the three different series that I've done retrospectives on. And that's that although they're all very different games, they all have one thing in common. They all have a very simple core mechanic at the heart of all of these games. And the fact that that mechanic is then taken and expanded upon over the levels. And it got me thinking, is there a name for this? So I tried to have a look online and I couldn't really find anything. So I sent out a tweet to ask anyone if they knew of a name for this style of game. And you guys had some fantastic suggestions, but it turns out that no, there is not one specific term for this kind of design philosophy. So in today's video, I'm going to be taking a look at some of the game design behind some of my favourite games and see what they have in common and see if we can come up with a term for it. And before we start today's video, I want to give a quick shout out to my channel sponsor, Bifrost Bridge Studios. I'm sure you've heard of them by now, but if you haven't, definitely go and check out their website. They're working hard on a new Game Boy Homebrew game, and I'm very much looking forward to playing it when it comes out later this year. So go and check out their website, they're doing lots of other neurodiverse media as well, which is very interesting. And as this is the first video in March, I just want to give a quick shout out to all of my new Patreon members who joined in February. They are Ken Yaktar, David Fisher, Dan and Atherston. So thank you so much, you four, and it would be great to see some more people joining them in March. And now, with the intro out of the way, let's talk talk game design. Did you say let's talk game design? Because I think I heard you say let's talk game design. What we're talking about here is a unique and often, I think, unappreciated style of game design that's so unknown it doesn't even have its own fancy sounding academic term. So allow me to coin the phrase spork design. Think of a spork. It's a single utensil that covers a multitude of uses in its design and function. And that's really what we're looking at. All right, we can't call it spork design, that's ridiculous. Instead, let's go with something that sounds a little bit more legitimate. Multi-purpose, focused mechanics. Think of something like a Swiss army knife. With its various fittings for cutting stuff, unscrewing things, screwing things back in, taking caps off bottles, cleaning your ears, etc. A multi-purpose focused mechanic is much the same. You'll see them a lot in games like Portal and the Katamari series, where one mechanic is extrapolated and stretched as far as it can go, with every other aspect like level design, aesthetics and sometimes even narrative being constructed around them. But my favourite example, and possibly the most obvious one, is Super Meat Boy. You might be thinking, alright, Super Meat Boy is all about jumping. There have been lots of games about jumping, what are you talking about? But if you look at something like Mario, as daft as this might sound, so please stay with me, that's not just about jumping. There are pickups and different mechanics that aren't related to your ability to jump, which extends Mario's variety but removes the focus from a multi-purpose focused mechanic. Super Meat Boy is entirely about your ability to jump from here to over there. Every level is meticulously structured to give you challenge and opportunity to master the ability to jump. Auxiliary mechanics like dashing and wall sliding are all in service of this jump to modify and modulate the jumping experience. From this, Team Meat produced an in-depth deconstruction of what a jump is, what it can do, and how far you can push it. Ed McMillan, in Indie Game The Movie, said of the level design and level mechanics that, as a designer, you want to explore each mechanic and make sure it can be enjoyed at least three or four different ways. If you can only get one use out of it, then it's pointless. And to take that even further, every level mechanic and obstacle in Super Meat Boy is overcome by this laser-like focus on learning how to jump and all the different ways that that can work. And to me, that is just sublime. Thanks Nick for letting me hijack this part of your video and be sure to give me a call the next time you're thinking, hey, let's talk game design. So wow, thank you so much for that fantastic explanation as to what makes these kind of games so special. Now for the rest of this video, I've picked out five examples of games that I think do this really well. So let's get started. Of course, the first three games here are the ones that I've done retrospectives on, so if you want some more insight into how these games play, I'd highly recommend going and checking those videos out. I'll put a link in the description below so you can go and see them in a lot more detail. But for now, I'm going to quickly talk about why I think that the core mechanic in these games works so well. Let's start with the first game here, which is Umihara Kawase. So, this entire game is built around the concept of using a grapple hook, and the levels take this single core concept and extract it as far as possible. There's some really expertly crafted levels in this game, and there's even some techniques that I didn't even know were possible. Check out some of these high level plays. Thank you. 
And it's things like this that make the simple mechanics that much more enjoyable. They all have a really, really high skill ceiling, but a very low barrier to entry. And that is what makes Umihara Kawase as a series so enjoyable to me. The second game here, and this one's quite a different take because you could say this about any racing game, but I chose Trackmania in particular because it is a very simple game in terms of mechanics. There's no like manual transmission or anything. There's no drifting as such. There's only brake, accelerate, left and right. And of course, this game is known for its crazy course designs. But if you play through the career mode, they start out really simple. And in the older games especially, there was also a platforming mode which really takes advantage of these really simple mechanics to make some crazy flashy levels that really put your skills to the test. And of course, you can't talk about simple mechanics without talking about Super Monkey Ball. Perhaps the most simplest game in existence. All you can do, in the first two games at least, is roll the ball around. That's literally it, and you can see the progression from the earlier stages into some of the Expert Plus levels, they are just insane. But none of them actually make you do anything different with the game itself. Every single level in the game is controlled in exactly the same way, and I think it is because the game is so simple and that's what makes it so, so addictive to play, and it makes you want to go back and get just a little bit better each time you go back and play it. And now I also picked out two other games that I think do this really well. So let's start by taking a look at the first one I've got here, which is Kuru 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 In for the Game Boy Advance. And yes, I've still got a pre-owned sticker on there for £3.99 from Game. Can you imagine going into a game shop today and buying a complete in-box Game Boy Advance game for £3.99? That would just be unheard of. And at the time, I really wish I'd known just how much more expensive games would have become because I would have bought a hell of a lot more than I did. So anyway, Kuru 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 In, for those of you that don't know, you're basically controlling a rotating stick through a maze. And that is the entire game. There's no extra mechanics that you need to worry about, at least not in the first game. All of the challenge comes from the progressive level difficulty and the amazing level designs that are seen throughout this game. They introduce a few new features, but they don't really interfere with the core mechanic, in fact they just add to it. So there's things later on like springs which flip the rotation of the blade and you can use that to sort of make your way through these different mazes and then later on the corridors get thinner and thinner and then you have to kind of thread the helicopter through the needle that is the maze. It's a super addictive game and it's also still super cheap to pick up as well so I would highly recommend it. There was also a sequel on the Game Boy Advance as well called Kuru in Paradise and I've got that one right here. And there was also another sequel a few years later which unfortunately still remains Japan only for the GameCube called Kuru in Squash. And if you've got a way to play them I highly recommend this series, it's so much fun and like I said that one simple mechanic is just extrapolated upon throughout the entire game and it makes for a really simple and rewarding game experience. And the final game here, and I picked something a little bit different for this one, this is one of the games that Yuji Naka made after he left Sega, the creator of Sonic. This is Ivy the Kiwi. And once again, it uses a very, very simple mechanic and the levels are all built around that. Basically in this game, you don't actually control the main character, this Kiwi, directly. Instead, you pull a vine by either pointing at the TV with the Wii version or using the touchscreen on the DS version. And it's kind of like Yoshi's Touch and Go where you can draw a line and the bird will move across it, but you can also sort of flick it up and flick it down and you can pull the line back and then let go and it'll rock it off into the bricks that you need to destroy or whatever. But that's literally it. That's the entire game and everything about this game just improves one level after the other and it really makes you understand these simple mechanics and these simple movements to be able to collect all of the feathers that are hidden in the different stages. It's a really good game and it's quite underrated in my opinion. You could call it a hidden gem, so maybe you'll be seeing this in the future on a hidden gems episode for the Wii. So there we go. I really hope you enjoyed this quite different take on a video idea. Thank you so much to Zane from Let's Talk Game Design for being a part of it. Definitely go and check his channel out. He's by far one of my favourite channels on YouTube at the moment and he's growing at a really good rate so definitely go and check him out. I'll put a link in the description so you can go and watch his videos. Please do that and please also subscribe to this if you enjoyed the episode. Please consider going to support me over on Patreon to see these videos early as well as behind the scenes views as well. And I'm almost at 10,000 subscribers so please subscribe. Please share this video if you enjoyed it and I think that's it for now so we'll see you all next week for the next episode. Goodbye!